Our panelists today represent a group of libertarian activists who are all lay people who are not professional libertarians. They all have day jobs and families and bills and the same kind of everyday concerns uh, that I'm sure most of you have. At a lot of conferences like this, we tend to get talks by academics uh, or intellectuals, so we thought it would be interesting to get the perspectives and the ideas and some strategies um, from just some intelligent lay people from all walks of life, different ages, different backgrounds and experiences. But I think you'll find that everybody on the panel is uh, very dedicated, very intelligent, and uh, might have some interesting ideas for us. I'm going to introduce everybody just very briefly. You can meet up with them later. Some of them provided their email addresses on the program. Uh, but what we've asked them to do is to give just a few brief moments of remarks of what they think from their perspective ought to be done. What's, what's a strategy or, or what are the tactics? What are the options available to us? Uh, and then when they're done, uh, we can field questions amongst the panelists themselves or, or from the audience. So we hope we'll have a good discussion with lots of feedback and, and uh, enthusiasm. Uh, on the end is Bill Haynes, our host today, someone I think a lot of you know quite well. He's been a libertarian for many decades and involved in the gold and silver business for many decades as well. Seated next to him is Catherine Muratore. She is a, a scientist, a biochemist with uh, advanced degrees in that field, and also uh, these days, uh, perhaps the most important job of all, a stay-at-home mother. Sitting uh, to her left is Jordan Osmond. She's someone who's been a friend of the Mises Institute and who uh, has the unique talent of being both an, an IT and a finance expert in one package. Uh, sitting next to her is someone I've known for a long time, Mark Victor. Uh, a very well-known attorney in the Phoenix area. He's tried and won some very high-profile cases, a uh, dedicated libertarian, and also a, a former student who I think is, whose life was changed by uh, being in law school with Butler Schaefer, Professor Butler Schaefer. <laughs> to my left here is Hunter Hastings, who is a, uh, a marketing expert who's worked uh, throughout his career for some of the biggest names in uh, Fortune 500 companies in the area of marketing, and he has some great ideas about strategy for the broader libertarian movement. Seated next to him is Taylor Conant. Uh, Taylor is a principal in the, in the Conant Automotive Group, which owns a series of automobile de dealerships across, uh, I guess, Southern California and, and some other states, and he also uh, manages and runs one of those dealerships himself. And finally, on the end, we have Dr. Don Prince, who has been a uh, libertarian stalwart for many decades. He is a, a retired medical doctor, a dermatologist, and once served as the head of AAPS, which is sort of the anti-AMA group within the profession of medicine. So a round of applause for our panel. Thanks to all of you <laughs> for agreeing to join us. And I told Bill that we would start with him. So Bill, take it away. Okay, I have three. Let me have this. We have some water here, please. I have three minutes to say that in a very brief, in that very brief three minutes, is that we cannot pass up any opportunity to bring even one individual to the libertarian idea, um, to bring them into libertarianism and the open of freedom and liberty. We have no idea who that person will impact in their lives. Now, personally, when I am discussing or sometimes it enters into a debate with a dedicated socialist, I do not try to bring him around to my point of view, but I try to present my case in a manner so that those people who are listening will be brought to my point of view. I would not waste my time sitting down with a dedicated socialist one-on-one -on -one and discussing anything with them. <laughs> Obviously, we need to abolish several federal departments and divisions, um, but we're here to discuss non-political solutions, and that would be a more political one. Um, my personal experience is in academia as a scientist, so I'll leave creative entrepreneurial scientists the task of finding market solutions that can poke holes in the regulatory apparatus. But there's a reason that I initially thought of abolishing federal-level agencies, and that is because not only is there vast regulation of applied medicine, but also a tremendous amount of funding of science in the United States. So I think a non-scientist who is interested in the cause of liberty can advance liberty in the sciences by 
just be more aware of funding of sciences. For example, the National Institutes of Health spent three quarters of a billion dollars this year to train over 15,000 scientists. Now, scientists don't think of themselves as being、uh, recipients of welfare, but they obviously are. At the 25th anniversary celebration of the Mises Institute, Professor Hoppe gave us a talk on anti-intellectual intellectuals, and they are those among us who think independently,、uh, fight for freedom, and against the state. He pointed out that the Mises Institute is central to providing alternative financing to anti-intellectual intellectuals. I agree with this.、Uh, as a graduate student, I did send some of my taxpayer-provided stipend. To the Mises Institute. <laughs> In return, they sent me at that time. It was called the,、uh, I think, Austrian Economics Home Study Course. So to borrow a term that uh, uh, Mr. Goyet, Goyet just、uh, used, I was immunized with that, and、uh, and we all need those booster shots.、Um, <clears throat> After being paid to complete a PhD and then looking towards a career of monetary support from federal grants, a libertarian scientist has to stay、uh, alert to、uh, to what the government is doing, especially in the fields of education and research.、Um, we can see that the current model is not lifting science up; it's bringing it down, and we can just look at examples. In the market, and compare that to the bloated biomedical research areas.、Um, but it's the theoretical framework of Austrian economics that gives that kind of observation meaning. And the libertarian scientist has to continually hold on to and study and get immunized with Austrian economics and sound history and philosophy、uh, and Rothbardian ethics.、Um, In order to continue to question the role of the state in scientific funding and research. As someone in the computer industry,、uh, I just want to say that entrepreneurialism is continuing to just explode, and the internet is completely assisting that through things like crowdsourcing and that sort of thing. So, from the standpoint of the entrepreneur, there are great things happening in the market.、Um, my question is: Is there a way that we can harness that as a group that has specific interests in,、uh, let's say, propagating the ideas of liberty and sharing those out with with more and more people broadly? Is there a way that we can do that, leveraging some of the entrepreneurial ideas? Um, I would actually add entrepreneurialism to Jeff's four solutions. I think instead of、uh, perhaps reacting to the system, we should be proactive and start really looking at ways that we can harness、uh, harness our communities, harness our knowledge,、uh, create new softwares.、Uh, if more people are Aware of how to implement their own servers,、uh, to、uh, leverage some of the technology that's out there, instead of you know buying into the we'll call them the big box、uh, outfits that are running that right now,、um, you know we could decentralize some of that because、uh, there is an advantage from a security standpoint to be decentralized. Uh, it's what we call security by obscurity, because they can't hit us all at once. But by the same token, then we're also all under the same level of scrutiny and surveillance,、uh, the violation of privacy rights, ready or not.、Uh, we just had an act passed on the 27th of October、uh, called the CISA、uh, Act, which is basically cyber. Cybersecurity、uh, information sharing. So, ready or not, they're about to find ways to share when you have a breach of data, who you are, what you were doing, and send it off to our friends, at, you know, the state and、uh, federal government, so that they can see what type of attack was taking place. 
Um, and that is an absolute breach of privacy. So read your privacy statements before you download software. The, the younger generation has no idea how insidious the Internet and the uh, folks that are managing our um, infrastructure are. Everything you have on social media, everything you have, even in an email, it's, it's, someone's got it somewhere. Whether, and this was well before the NSA information came out. It's stored by the nature of the Internet. Someone has a copy of that. So just assume that that information is out there. But there have to be some ways that we could decentralize and leverage the knowledge of the, the people in this room and start creating new structures, new ways of sharing information that could uh, actually benefit uh, the libertarian movement um, and freedom in general without having to be... In other words, let's stay one step ahead of them. You know, we don't have to always be reactive. So that's, that's my, my uh, proposal. Sure. <clears throat> Okay, so the short guy's got to stand up. <laughs> yes, I'm standing. <clears throat> First off, um, I want to take issue with something that was said already. I, I do think we should confront the socialists. Let's not be freedom wimps. We're right about this stuff, and let's get out there and confront them. Uh, we may convert some people. There are probably people in this room who started out as socialists. What, what's to lose? Nothing to lose and lots of things to gain. Let's confront everybody on everything all the damn time. <laughs> okay, so how to fix the justice system in five minutes. Here it goes. <clears throat> I got six things I want to say. Number one. We're not going to fix anything anywhere at any time until we can win more hearts and minds, period. That's the only way to get freedom. We got to win more hearts and minds. It doesn't matter who's elected. It doesn't matter what the Constitution says. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court interprets. Do we have enough people who understand the ideas of liberty? That's where we need to be focusing. If we got enough, we'll have freedom. If we don't, like right now, we'll have tyranny. So that's where we need to focus about fixing the justice system, really, and everything else. But number two, you can't fix the justice system until you fix the law, period. It doesn't matter. We got to get rid of all victimless crimes. We got, think of this as, think of this as two separate areas of the justice system. We've got procedure, which is how do we sort of process cases through the system. Then we've got the substantive law. The procedure's not that bad. If you made me the king of the procedure, there's a lot of things I'd change, but it's really not that terrible. We do a pretty decent job, not perfect, but pretty decent at figuring out who's really guilty and who's not guilty, which really just means the state hasn't proven their case. But it doesn't matter if what they're guilty of is a bunch of stupid shit that shouldn't be against the law in the first place. So, so fixing the effectiveness of the system doesn't matter and is completely irrelevant until we can fix the law. Number three, what I'll call jury education. Here's what I mean by this. The jury was supposed to be the final check on state power. Just had a buddy of mine who's a lawyer in Italy who I met because of Lou Rockwell. He read one of my articles in Italy and he contacted me and said, hey Mark, I'm a lawyer in Italy. He came to visit me a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the system. They don't have jury trials there. Could be a big problem. What I love about the jury trial is when I'm standing up there and we've gone through a lot of aggravation by the time I stand up in closing argument in front of the jury, but when I'm standing there, it's just me and the jurors. It's me and the rest of the people's representatives. They should be able to do whatever they want to do. We should be able to get the bureaucrats and the uh, tyrannical big government nuts out of the way. It's just me and them. I need to be able to tell them, you can judge the law as well as the facts. I need to be able to stand there and say, ladies and gentlemen, even if you think the state's proven the case, the law screwed up. Who cares if this guy really had marijuana? Find him not guilty. 
But in addition to that, we need to be able to tell them what the punishment is. They don't get to know what the punishment is. Could you imagine being a juror and coming back with a guilty verdict thinking that this guy's going to get probation when because of our crazy, ridiculous uh, punishments that we have now all throughout the United States, and Arizona is one of the worst states on this, they don't understand that they just completely ruined somebody's life. People make decisions based differently on what they understand to be the gravity of the decision. As Judge Kaczynski pointed out in an article recently on this very point, we think differently. We, we invest different amounts of time in whether we should go to Starbucks or some other coffee house in the morning versus whether we're going to buy a new house, right? Shouldn't I be able to tell them, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you come back with a guilty, my guy's got to do 20 years. Think about it carefully. I can't say one peep about that. We got to educate the juries. Number four. We need to abolish mandatory minimum sentences. Yeah. I, I, I can't go to trial in a lot of these cases. I talk to the gun guys all the time, and the gun guys give me these scenarios, and they say, you know, Mark, what if this, that, and the next thing happens, and then I shoot somebody in my house? Maybe it's a good shooting, but if it's close, they're never going to get to trial because the situation is gonna be such that if the jury comes back and says that they acted reasonably, they leave with me, we go, they buy me dinner. If the jury comes back and says, no, you were unreasonable, then they go away for maybe 20 years. None of you will take that chance. All of you will walk in and plead guilty to a lesser charge because you're stuck with the mandatory minimum if you lose. We need to be able to give judges the power to say, you know what, even though the person has been found guilty, and it could be first degree murder still, there needs to be an option for probation. So people are allowed to send cases in front of the jury. I can't tell you how many cases I would have loved to have tried in front of a jury that I can't because the risk is too high. Number five, we got to reduce caseloads the crushing volume of the caseloads in our system. There's an article today in the Washington Post about this, and they name Maricopa County, and they have identified here some of the worst death penalty lawyers ever. You would think that in a death penalty case, we'd have tons of resources and tons of attention. I've done lots of death penalty cases. I just, I'm finishing one up now. We have such crushing caseloads that these public defenders and even prosecutors just don't have enough time. And that's never going to be reduced until the drug war ends, period. Yeah. Huge lack of resources. And then finally, number six, because I know I'm uh, running out of time. We got we to gotta get real about the Commerce Clause and about federal jurisdiction. We got this monstrosity of a federal justice system. I can remember talking to a federal prosecutor recently, and I said, I said, is there anything you think you don't have jurisdiction over? And we talked about lots of things. And I said, what about a DUI case? Do you think the federal government could prosecute DUI cases? And he says, well, cars move in interstate commerce and all the parts are made. And he's absolutely right. This is a slam dunk win for the federal government in terms of a jurisdiction. There is nothing that I can think of that the federal government couldn't exercise its jurisdiction over. And so we gotta get all these crimes out of the federal government. We gotta, we gotta get the Commerce Clause. And I know I, hear, I, I, I can hear Butler over there because he taught me about the Commerce Clause. He's gonna give me a hard time when I meet with him. But we gotta do something different with the Commerce Clause because it reaches everything. It's an infinite source of endless federal jurisdiction. Until we fix that, there's no fix in the federal justice system. Anyways, let's just focus on winning hearts and minds. Whatever it is you do, if you write, if you speak, if you're, if you're Lou and you got a big, big website out there, I don't even care anymore if you run for office. I don't even care if you run as a Republican and you're Rand Paul. More power to him. Hunter. Can you stand? Sure. Thank you. See, so I've started the train. That's you did. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> So what must be done? Here's my proposal. We need to build a more attractive and more cohesive brand for liberty. 
So let me explain that. As Jeff said, my professional experience is in building brands, brands that people love, brands that people are devoted to. Think about Pepsi and Apple and Jack Daniels, one of my favorites, and BMW. <laughs> Many of these started as niche properties and were expanded into uh, global brands with, with dominant preferences. Successful brands have a couple of, of attributes. Firstly, they offer their adherents a, it's what we call a functional benefit. There's something in it for them. They make individual lives better, or at least on the subjective preference scale, they make people feel like their lives are better. So brand marketing is a very Austrian concept. You figure out what people want and you, and you give it to them and they rate it on their own subjective scale. Second, brands stand for something powerful that can generate just astonishing levels of emotional investment and tremendously loyal behavior. Apple makes you technologically astute and socially cool at the same time. Jack Daniels makes you authentic. <laughs> at least for a while. BMW makes you feel like you're the best driver in charge of the best equipment. So these brands stand for something that's very attractive to people. The Liberty brand actually lacks many of the attributes of a successful brand. I think our brand is in danger of being perceived as negative. We tend to be against a lot of things, if not against everything, rather than <laughs> relentlessly positive and optimistic, which I think we should be. We're not always really clear what liberty means for the individual. How does it make a difference in their, in their everyday lives? And we don't consistently engender that emotional investment of great brands. Although we have to say Dr. Paul did that in his campaigning and showed what could be done. So there's a, there's a terrific sign there. So I don't have six things, but I have three things. First, make it clear that we are for the individual. We believe in individuals, we love individuals, we believe they can succeed and, and we want them to succeed. The state hates individuals, they repress individuals. And so we need to be for that emotional uh, heroism of individuals. Individuals are liberty's heroes. The functional and benefit then is exercising individual economic power. We are economic power. We're the biggest part of the economy. So let's bring that to life. Let's empower people. Mises said that consumer is boss because the consumer decides what is produced based on their preferences. And to Jordan's point, the entrepreneur directs the market economy by rearranging the factors of production to produce what consumers want. That's economic power. So let's bring this to life. Let's promote individual economic power. Entrepreneurs, as Jordan said, but it doesn't have to be Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. It's starting a small business in your, in your locality. It's freelancing. Uh, Mary Mika says there are 38 million freelancers in the economy, and so there's, there's, there's lots of opportunities at that level. An individual can harness the power of cloud computing. They can, they can uh, get Kickstarter financing. They can use the internet. There's no limit to the, to the scale that individuals can, can operate at. So let's drive that individual opportunity. Then on the opposite side, refuse to do business with the big crony businesses. Let's support our entrepreneurs and do our business locally and, and, and do it with entrepreneurs. And especially refuse to do business with the big banks, which a lot of us have identified as, as particular crony capitalism. That's radical decentralization. Let's do it all with our, in our local communities with local businesses. Let's do for localness in economics, what Whole Foods did for local produce. I was, uh, I was listening to John Mackey the other day and he says he's taken the local produce uh, component, or local organic produce a component from 5% to 30% in a very short period of time. Just think of that. Just think if we could get 30% of people to switch their accounts from a big bank to the local community bank. That would get noticed. So economic power at the local level. And then the emotional benefit is pride. Let's be proud of our own self-reliance. Let's throw off the dependency that the state insists that we all have. Pride in localness, pride in the exercise of our individual economic power. Let's make proud self-reliance and the voluntary collaboration of self-reliant people like us 
the highest value for the individual. And then the last thing is that we need a brand leader, and as Mr. Goyait said, there's no, nobody better than the Ludwig von Mises Institute to be that brand leader. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to be reading notes from my phone. I'm not checking my Twitter or updating my Facebook. So, um, <clears throat> so my ideas about what is to be done are related to communication, uh, specifically how to change our language, our conceptualization, and our organization so we can have more influence. And um, I believe that these techniques are in the vein of the strategy of um, winning hearts and minds. Um, but I need to apologize to Mark for my first point because it's going to sound a little wimpy, and um, I hope you can just read between the lines on it. So, um, First, libertarians excel at rational judgment and evaluation. We're able to scrutinize any social in, uh, situation and quickly determine who is right and who is wrong, who is moral and who is immoral. But we're, what we're not so good at is communicating our values and needs and thoughtfully considering those that motivate others, particularly those values and needs that are universal to all of mankind. I think libertarians would benefit enormous, enormously from mastering the art of empathy, as best described in Marshall Rosenberg's book, Nonviolent Communication. With greater empathy, we can not only listen for what others, um, we, can, we can not only listen for what others need so we can explain the solutions we have to offer, but we can better explain our own needs and help others to understand that we are not motivated by blind faith to rational ideology. I see empathy as the true language of liberty that all libertarians can embrace. Second, libertarians seem to spend a lot of time conceptualizing the flaws of our current system, as Hunter mentioned, and uh, imagining the methods by which it might end, to the point of even fetishizing collapse. But we spend comparatively less time imagining what might replace it and offering these entrepreneurial visions to others. While it's true that no one can know for sure what the future state of a free market might look like, each one of us can come up with a vision and take steps to turn it into a reality. If we took all the time and the energy we invest in fantasizing about the collapse of the state, the death of the dollar, and the bankruptcy of the welfare system, and instead worked out business models for voluntary security or, uh, organizations and alternative currencies and community aid organizations, we could start putting them into practice now and start living in a libertarian future. Let's offer others a practical vision of the future and how it might function differently. Let's each come up with something specific that we do with more liberty than we have right now, rather than obsess about liberty like it is an end in and of itself and not a means to other ends. Third, I believe libertarians should be the most organized social enclave around, and to that end, we should all form our own local associations of like minds and get together on a regular basis. These Mises circles are great, but they only happen a few times a year. And Hans Hermann Hoppe's Property and Freedom Society is an excellent forum, but it takes place far, far away. <laughs> Libertarians often like to think of themselves as the brave but lonesome voice of sanity. But we aren't really alone, or at least we don't have to be. I formed a group in my local town that meets monthly to read and discuss Austro-Libertarian ideas, and I've found that generally people interested in freedom are free-thinking in other areas as well, such as nutrition, parenting philosophies, and even personal values and lifestyle. These organizations are a great way to gain new perspectives and form real friendships that add to our quality of life and turn our obsession with liberty into another practical social advantage. So, uh, in, in closing, a language of empathy, a constructive conceptualization process, and a local association of like minds. These are three ideas which could improve every libertarian's communication and influence. Although I'm speaking for a practice of medicine, the first concept I would mention is applicable to everything. And that is, if you are a patient, a consumer in this case, you need to have the money yourself. Because only in that way do you have the power to make your correct decisions. As an individual physician, I must look only to you and this concept has been greatly distorted over the past 60 years. As many of the things happened, this started during a war, in this case, World War II, 
where people started to looking for a third party to fund some or sometimes all of the money. So the first concept is to be sure the patient, the consumer, stays in your hands. This also has a huge uh, concept also relating to that in that you make the best decisions to satisfy you, not a third party. And what I would like to point out is now that almost all of the money is flowing not to you, the patient, but is run by a third party, I pointed out this is just exactly now, instead of a practice of medicine, it's like veterinary medicine. The person paying the money, in this case the owner, con contacts the vet and says, should we pay for this or not? Fifi, the, the patient in that case, is left out of this entirely. And you know, when I first pointed out this concept, people grasped that right away. The, the complaints I had, interesting enough, was the veterinarians, which I thought was quite <laughs> The second concept is to return to true insurance. Insurance is not to be paid for the everyday activities. It is something that financially would be catastrophic economically if you faced that. So we need to go back to the, the concept of true insurance and the insurance should be owned by you through a market experience. The idea that now that I am over 65, I can focus only to one insurance where I must pay over a lifetime just for that so-called insurance is absolutely wrong. And the third thing I'd like to point out is I am a physician. Uh, the third party like to refer to me as a provider. I'm a provider to my family. I'm not a provider for the, the government. Mm -hmm. And so I, I view this as a concept because I must focus back to what I mentioned only to you. It is only in this way that as a physician to a patient, the most intimate information the patient can give to me as a physician to benefit the patient most. And that type of privacy is totally violated when a third party enters into this, what should be a beautiful relationship. I have watched in my lifetime a, a beautiful profession which was one of the honors profession, he turned into a profession that was more like the oldest profession. Thank you. Let me just, uh, let me just mention that Peter Kalman is an entrepreneur uh, for, and a representative for Kalman Associates, which puts on trade shows around the world. He's also been an absolutely outstanding uh, campus coordinator uh, on behalf of the Mises Institute. So, so Peter? Thank you, Jeff. Hi. So I'm really bad at following instructions and getting to places on time when people tell me to. Sorry about that. But I'm also not very good at telling other people what to do. Um, so when I first heard the topic of today, it kind of struck me as kind of interesting for libertarians to be talking about what people, other people must be doing. Um, and I, so I just want to kind of start with a show of hands. Can, uh, can you raise your hand for me if you're a voluntarist? That is, if you believe in nonviolent uh, cooperation, in humans uh, interacting without coercion, without force, and if you believe that uh, violence is wrong no matter who's doing it, and if you believe that good ideas don't require force. I'd, I'd love if you could raise your hand for me. I'd hope that everyone, all right, a few people don't, but that's all right. So I'm not going to make your hands tired, I promise. Keep them up, keep them up. Now, keep your hands up if you believe in voluntarism as a philosophy that's going to bring us to a freer society. Lower your hand if anyone in your immediate family disagrees with you. That's if any of your parents, any of your siblings, any of your spouses, or any of your daughters or sons uh, happen to believe that government is a solution to bring us to a freer society. Okay, there's a lot less hands. Now, I'm going to have to put my hand down for the next one. If anyone in your extended family disagrees with you, put your hands down. I've got about 30 uncles, I'm from New Jersey, so I'm not, there's no way I'm gonna get all of them. But, um, you know, I think you guys can see where I'm going with this. Uh, are all of your friends voluntarists? Are all the people that you buy on, uh, your vendors that you buy from on a day-to-day -day basis, are they voluntarists? Are, you know, are all your clients libertarians? Are all the people you're doing business with libertarians? You know, and I think this is a really good place to start thinking about things. I think, um, really the only thing we can change is what's immediately around us, and honestly, really the only thing we can change is ourselves. Um, but we can set an example through our successes for those who would like to follow it. We can't force anyone to follow it, obviously, but if our Austrian economics and philosophies of nonviolence and avoiding coercion 
can lead us to greater successes because we've removed that bureaucracy, that layer of fat from the government. I think that is going to show people and create a bourgeois around the idea of being a, a libertarian because uh, the successes will speak, will speak for themselves. You know, um, there are, you know, there are a lot of ways around this political action. Um, you know, I've got some books here from the RLC of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Los Angeles County. Um, some, some guys that are undercover anarchists that are infiltrating the Republican Party, uh, <laughs> trying to get delegates for someone, somebody, I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of things people touched on, but I kind of want to go back to um, agorism, which was kind of um, touched upon. Um, a few of the people, you know, Hunter and um, Taylor, was it? Yeah, spoke about uh, engaging with the communities that we're a part of. It's just sort of my, my theme as well. Um, I work with Liberty.menu. It's on a website that's on uh, the program next to my name. It's, an, it's a place for liberty-minded entrepreneurs to find one another. You know, uh, my suit was made by a voluntarist. If you bought your suit at Macy's, you're contributing to the state. Uh, you know, that, that might seem a little bit ridiculous, but I mean, I don't really think that the black or gray markets are as as uh, faux pas as people imagine, because the first three years of my life uh, employed from 12 to 15 at my uncle's sandwich shop, I was getting paid under the table. And I think that's a pretty common occurrence for people back east, maybe not out here, but um, I know there's a lot of black and gray markets that's not just selling drugs. So <laughs> I, I don't know, I just, I, I find that, that if we all are cooperating with each other nonviolently and, and through peaceful means, we can set an example through our actions rather than uh, badgering people and telling them what to do. And as far as the hearts and minds go, we really need to work on the ones that are closest to us before we work on the rest of the world. So.